Hello everyone, Dr. Yonit Arthur here. I'm an audiologist and strength coach. You are on The Steady Coach, and it is my great honor today to bring you this interview with Dr. Howard Schubiner. Dr. Schubiner may not need an introduction for many of you, but in case you're not familiar with his work, Dr. Schubiner is one of the leading physicians, one of the world experts in mind-body conditions or medically unexplained chronic conditions such as chronic pain and yes, chronic dizziness. Dr. Schubiner is board certified in pediatrics, adolescent medicine, and internal medicine. And he is a clinical professor at the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, as well as the founder of the Mind Body Medicine Program at Providence Hospital. He is also the co-founder of the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association. He has authored more than 100 publications in scientific journals and books, and was recently awarded a multi-million dollar grant by the National Institute of Health to study emotional awareness and expression therapy in people suffering from certain types of chronic pain. So Dr. Schubiner, again, is one of the greats in our field, and it is truly my privilege to bring some of his wisdom and some of his thoughts specifically on chronic dizziness conditions like triple PD, MDDS, and vestibular migraine today. We go into the experiences he's had with these conditions in his clinical experience. We talk about the negative messaging around these conditions from conventional biomedical standpoints. And we talk a lot today about the role that fear and emotions play in both causing these symptoms and keeping them chronic. And Dr. Schubiner gives some actionable ways of working through these things so you can fully recover. Please enjoy this interview as much as I enjoy talking to Dr. Schubiner. And again, if you have questions, comments, please drop them below. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy. Okay, Howard, thank you so much for being here with me. It's such a privilege and an honor to have you join us on this channel where you probably already know we talk about chronic dizziness. Yeah. So, yeah. Dizzy, dizzy doctor. Yes, that's that's I, I that's starting to be what people know me as. But I, I try to I tried when I started the channel, I call it the steady coach because I said, well, instead of calling it something dizzy, let's call it something that's not dizzy. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 OK, so I think most people who watch my channel already have some idea of who you are. But maybe for those who don't, could you briefly introduce yourself and explain your background and what you do? Sure. Well, I'm an internal medicine physician. I've also trained in pediatrics and adolescent medicine over the years. I've had a long career, which just means my hair is all gray now. <laughs> and I've been, uh, I was at Wayne State University Medical School for 18 years. And I switched mm -hmm. to Ascension Providence Hospital for the last 20 years. I'm a clinical professor at Michigan State University. College of Human Medicine. And for the last 20 years, I've been doing what I would basically refer to as mind-body medicine or ways of understanding how people can have symptoms that for all the world seem very physical, uh, like there's something structurally wrong with their body, but yet not actually have physical or structural damage and it's a very, it's kind of a confusing area for a lot of people because it's hard to reconcile the idea. If it's not structural, then it's all in your head. If it's all in your head, then it's not real. If it's not real, you're faking it. Well, that's clearly not true with any of these conditions, uh, but that's what people kind of hear when they hear about mind-body medicine. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, people are often told that they're structurally damaged when they're actually not. And that creates a lot of suffering, as we can talk about if you want. But um, so I've been trying to do research and teach and write and see patients over these last 20 years in this 
space, it's a little niche and within medicine and medical practice that most people and most doctors actually don't really understand. So that's yes. been for the last 20 years. Mm. Yes. Yes. Well, well done summing all of your incredible work up into about a, a two minute segment there. Um, and we're going to talk a little more about that, the fact that it is niche and this is actually part of the problem that people often are given these erroneous messages about what their symptoms actually mean. And that makes the problem so much worse and often leads to these very chronic long-term symptoms. Uh, but before we do that, I, knowing that the folks who watch my channel are, are here because they're suffering from chronic dizziness, and then they see the word pain on your website, and they see the word pain on your book, they see the word pain discussed on the psychophysiologic disorders website. So are chronic dizziness disorders that don't have a medical explanation actually mind-body conditions? Yes. <laughs> the simple answer is yes, mm -hmm. uh, but that's true for any condition. Mm -hmm. So the point is, is that this is, it seems like a niche within medicine where <clears throat> there's a space for, for carving out what's uh, this mind, you know, understanding how the brain works in these syndromes that are actually mind-body syndromes. But mm -hmm. it turns out these are the most common syndromes that people have, they are the most common sources of disability in the world. Many of them are pain, like headache, migraine, back pain, neck pain, stomach pain, pelvic pain. Most of those, the majority of those chronic conditions uh, are actually mind-body or what we would call neuroplastic conditions. Mm -hmm. But there are so many others such as you know, urinary frequency or ringing in the ear, tinnitus, uh, or burning sensations, tingling, numbness sensations, uh, sensations of people, itchy sensations. Mm -hmm. Dizziness is another sensation. Mm -hmm. And it turns out when you study the brain and you understand how the brain works, the brain works by predictive processing, which means that our brains literally create what we experience, which is a weird thing to say and, and kind of hard to understand. What does that mean? Our brain creates mm -hmm. our experience. When you touch a hot stove, it's not your finger causing pain. It's actually the brain. And we know that because people can have injuries and have no pain at all. And then when you, you know, you turn that into other sensations like dizziness, when one is dizzy, it's a sensation that the brain is creating. And there's two main reasons. Why would the brain create dizziness? One, there's something wrong with your inner ear. The balance center, the vestibular center of, of the brain, uh, the nerves and the semicircular canals and the crystals and everything that help us to maintain balance, uh, if those are damaged, the signals can go to the brain and then the brain can produce the feelings of dizziness because it's getting those kinds of alarming signals from the ear, from the nerves in the ear. Um, but what happens when someone is dizzy and they don't have an abnormality or structural damage in the balance center? Then the brain is creating the sense of dizziness in the absence of this peripheral damaging input. The brain is creating that sensation. And then we'd have to ask, why would the brain do that? And so what you said earlier was there's a message. People may get the message that they're damaged just because they have a symptom, any symptom, including dizziness. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes or, or very frequently in chronic situations, it, there is no structural damage. And the message is actually totally different than your body is broken or damaged. The message is actually going to be something way more weird and interesting and odd and profound, which is maybe there's an imbalance in your life in some way. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we're going to touch on this. What, what imbalance 
you and some of your colleagues have researched over the years that tends to lead to some of these chronic conditions. I, I was just curious first, because again, I know, and as you have many years of experience with folks going through this, you know, people often need to hear the name of the symptom-based diagnosis that they have in order to say, oh, oh, okay, this actually is about me. So I'm wondering if you have seen some of these diagnoses in your clinical practice, some of these symptom-based dizziness diagnoses like persistent postural perceptual disorder, triple PD, Malda de Barkmont syndrome, MDDS, vestibular migraine, That's a that one's um, in vogue right now, um, and some others, chronic subjective dizziness. Have you seen those personally in your practice? Yeah, for sure. They're mm -hmm. very common. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like there are many names for different kinds of headache disorders. Mm -hmm. We define headache disorders as primary or secondary. Primary meaning there's no secondary cause, no structural damage cause. Mm -hmm. And with dizziness. So you have primary dizziness or secondary dizziness. But the name that's given to it is descriptive of what the sensations are when they occur. But it's not, the name doesn't mean whether it's primary or secondary. The name mm -hmm. doesn't mean where it's neuroplastic, which would be primary, or secondary where there's structural damage. Mm -hmm. the conditions that you just mentioned do not, are not caused by structural damage, so therefore they're primary. Mm -hmm. We treat all primary conditions the same. It doesn't matter if someone has one or other of those diagnoses, if, if the sensations are they're dizzy when they stand up or they're dizzy when they turn their head or they're dizzy when they bend down or they're dizzy all the time. The question is, is there a structural damage causing it or not? And when mm -hmm. there's not, then it falls into this category of disorders that can be reversed. Mm -hmm by changing the neural circuits in the brain, which is a totally different situation than being told that you're damaged and you're incurable and you can never solve this problem and you'll just have to cope with it the rest of your life. That's a horrible and incorrect message to be giving to people, but it's done all the time. Mm -hmm. And do you, I'm, I'm wondering, again, since you've seen folks like this in your clinical practice, then if you've not to say that people who have chronic pain don't get these messages too. They, everyone with any of these conditions can get this message. But it seems to me that people with dizziness disorders, because vestibular disorders are more mysterious, there are, there are fewer practitioners who understand vestibular disorders. It seems that they're almost always given the message that there's just something horribly wrong with their brain and they have an incurable neurological condition. I'm curious to see if that's something that you've seen as well. Right, but that's true of all conditions. Mm -hmm. Very, because doctors are trained to think that a symptom means there's something wrong with the body. And that may certainly be the case. Mm -hmm. um, there are diseases that cause damage to our mm -hmm. bodies. Mm -hmm. Doctors are not trained to look for and understand and, and diagnose conditions that are neuroplastic or primary or mind-body conditions in any part of the body. So whenever there's any symptom, people, doctors are, and other you know, medical professionals are looking for some name to give it and some disease to pin it on, assuming that it must be structural because there's a symptom. Mm -hmm. But that's a very erroneous <laughs> concept. I was talking to a spine surgeon yesterday, and he said, you know, once he opened his eyes to this, he thought all, all spine conditions were structural. And now he realizes that the majority of people with these chronic conditions are not structural. And he says, I can't unsee that. Now that I know it, I can't unsee it. But my, all my colleagues, they don't see it. They don't mm -hmm. Mm, yeah. Yep. And we see this happening with this these post-COVID sy symptoms too, don't we? So I, I see a lot of those folks because a lot of them have dizziness as a primary symptom. And because it's post-COVID, the assumption is, okay, well, automatically that means there was damage to tissues that then led to symptoms. 
And and from your experience, again, that that's simply not correct. Right. There are <clears throat> the COVID, like any other virus infection or any bacterial infection, can cause damage in the body. Mm -hmm. The early COVID infections cause pneumonia, and you know a lot of people died due to that pneumonia. The more recent COVID infections are not producing pneumonia by and large. They're more relegated to nose and throat kind of problems. So it's much more mild. The cases are much milder. But and but the point is, is that even if you have tissue damage, even if you have pneumonia uh, or heart or lung disease from COVID, once the virus goes, you're either left with thumb damage or you're not. The vast majority of people with COVID are left with no physical, structural, ongoing damage. But yet there's this 10 to 30 percent, depending on the numbers, um, that are plagued with symptoms that are persistent mm -hmm. and very real. They're not imaginary. People aren't making them up. Or it's not because they want them. It's not because they're crazy or weak or, or um, demented or anything. It's they're real symptoms, but they are symptoms. And so in our experience and the research we've done, the vast majority of people with long COVID do not have the structural damage to the heart or lungs. And certainly the symptoms of dizziness and fatigue and brain fog and inattention and um, kind of uh, other, other uh, pains and things like that, they are not caused by structural damage. And those people can be cured. I was on the phone yesterday with some a couple of women who were cured, totally cured from long COVID symptoms that were very severe by doing the work that you're helping people do and that I've been helping people do. Um, so, you know, but they were told in the long COVID clinics that they went to that they were incurable, that they would have to live with these symptoms forever because somehow COVID had damaged them um, that to, to the point where they were incurable. And, and that's it's just so wrong and it's, it's heartbreaking to have people hear those messages because when you get the message that you're incurable, that you're structurally damaged, that you're crippled, that you're that you can't get better, that actually makes it worse. The symptoms will actually get worse. Um, and what happens is people get what's called the nocebo effect, which is thinking that they're going to be worse makes them actually worse. And the the neural circuits of the brain respond to fear and worry and depression and despair and frustration. And all those things happen when people are given this incorrect message that they can't get better. And so this, the neural circuits get more ingrained and the symptoms spread over time. And I'm sure you've seen people who they may start with dizziness, but, but over time the dizziness then spreads to stomach pain and headache and, and brain fog and can't concentrate and chronic fatigue and all these other symptoms and people are getting worse and worse despite the fact that there's nothing structurally wrong but it's so so frustrating for people to be stuck in that world and and feel like they have no hope mm -hmm. yeah so you've spent your career basically combating that biomedical approach to these symptoms correct yeah exactly yeah wrong with the biomedical approach when there's a structural damage sure you have cancer or heart disease or diabetes or COPD um, you know those things cause the major are the major causes of mortality in the world and mm -hmm. that better and better biomedical treatments for it but when you apply this bio purely biomedical role to a, a mind body or neuroplastic syndrome it, it doesn't work Right. Right. Okay. So you mentioned the role of the nocebo effect. And and to sum that up, it's not just people's own beliefs, what they're Googling. It's also the messages they're getting from medical professionals that, well, you know, we can do CBT to help you cope with this condition. That's part of the standard of practice for triple PD. We give you cognitive behavioral therapy and physical therapy, and maybe an SSRI. Good luck. 
So they're told they can cope, but they're not told they can get better. And then people with MDDS are told they can't get better at all. They, they're, they're specifically told it's incurable. Mm -hmm. And when they, when people stop having symptoms, they call it remission. Mm -hmm. So how, how have you seen this kind of messaging affect the course of someone's recovery? Does it, is it harder to get someone untangled from that if they've been given these kinds of messages? Yeah, because you're giving them an opposite message. And who are they supposed to believe? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the people giving them the, the negative and what I would term incorrect messages are very highly esteemed people who have long CVs and uh, mm -hmm. run these run these programs, and they're the world's expert. You know, countries are world's experts. Mm -hmm. But what what we're giving them is an alternative explanation. And so it may be difficult for them to believe the alternative explanation, but usually we can show them by the by demonstration of what their characteristics of their dizziness or other symptoms are to show them that they can shift or move or turn off or get worse with stress or get better with calming or um change in ways based on time of day or based on the weather or all sorts of things mm -hmm. that we can begin to show them in their own lives the demonstration of these neural circuits and by definition neural circuits can turn and up can turn on and off and change mm -hmm. well and and if people are interested the the psychophysiologic disorders association actually has a checklist on, on the website. So I can, I'll link to that in the description of the interview. So people can go there to look at that. Right. And we can also give them, uh, help them understand why they got it in the first place, because mm -hmm. as we were saying before, there may be a message from their brain about something going on in their life. Mm. And, if, and, and it turns out that the underlying reason why these things, these kind of mind, body or psychophysiologic conditions start in the first place has to do with stress and has to do with emotions and research shows that emotions activate the same parts of the brain as does a physical injury mm -hmm. so the symptoms are real but it also shows that emotion can cause symptoms that are real and that can be extremely severe and that's hard for hard for people to really wrap their hands around, wrap their arms around sometimes because the symptoms seem and are can be so severe mm -hmm. that it's really hard for, for them to say, you mean my brain is producing this? That's that severe? Is that possible? And research shows, and we know from hundreds of years of, of work in this field, literally, that the brain can cause people to, to have extremely severe symptoms in the absence of structural damage. And that's just mm -hmm. a Right. Or in the case of some of folks, some of the folks with chronic dizziness, it, in the absence of tissue damage that actually explains the conditions, because sometimes they'll find abnormalities. Right. They'll find, oh, well, you know, you had neuritis, you, you lost some function in your ear. But most people who have that, their brain compensates, it figures it out, it rebalances things and they move on. So, but then... I know this happens with chronic pain too. People, you know, will see an image of a, of a, you know, a slipped disc and, oh my gosh, that's the cause. That's why I have this chronic back pain. But just because someone has tissue damage also doesn't necessarily explain that their, their chronic symptoms either. Right. We've been on this earth for 60, at least 60,000 years and people were not made to have chronic symptoms with some kind of injury. Injuries heal. And the brain is incredibly neuroplastic. The brain heals. Mm -hmm. The brain has ways of developing new, neuro, new and different neural circuits around issues that are that have been damaged. People who have a stroke have death of brain tissue, yet mm -hmm. they recover most of the time. Their brain learns pathways around that, and um, and it's a it's it's just a normal part of healing process that mm -hmm. we all have. Mm -hmm. So would it be all right if we come back to something you said a few moments ago about emotions? Because I had the privilege of learning from both you and Mark Lumley recently 
about some of the research that you've done and the work you've done surrounding emotional expression and emotional awareness. So you mentioned that frequently symptoms are resulting from an emotional cause. There's an um, something something is going on in someone's life. And I was wondering if you could explain more about how that can actually cause physical symptoms and how awareness of those emotions and expression of those emotions can help. Right. I mean, everyone knows that emotions can cause physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows if you get embarrassed, your face and neck may turn red. Everyone knows if you have a stressful day, you may get a headache. Everyone knows if you have to give a speech in front of some people, a large group of people, your hand may be shaky or your stomach may be flipping, flipping, flipping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say turning into knots or whatever. <laughs> and, um, and people of anxiety have physical sensations with that. People of depression have physical sensations. And so this, everyone knows that. It's not, it's, it's not some secret and it's not mm -hmm. a weird or a special thing. And when people are in a situation where they feel hurt, trapped, fearful, there's no way out, uh, the brain will produce some kind of message that goes along with that, which is like a smoke alarm. When there's mm -hmm. enough power, the alarm will go off. And with the smoke alarm, the alarm isn't the problem. The alarm is a good thing. It's telling us there's a problem. And it's the same with the brain and the body. When someone gets dizziness or headache or stomach pain, what's happening, if there's no, if there's no injury to cause it, there's a reason for it and what's going on in their life. It may be that they have a very difficult work situation, a colleague or a boss. They have a very difficult marriage. They have a child who's, who's in danger from drugs or bullying or something, or they have a parent who's dying or, or any, you know, sorts of things that make them fearful, afraid, worried, hurt, angry, upset, they feel guilty, they feel ashamed. All these emotions actually are real. Emotions are real. Mm -hmm. As them, they're, not they're not bad. And they occur in these situations. And when they occur, the neural circuit wiring of the brain is wired to produce some sort of message. And that's exactly what happens. And then that symptom can become chronic the symptom can continue to occur because those neural circuits become learned, just like you learn how to ride a bike. The neural circuits get reinforced by fear, worry, frustration, despair. Those things actually, as we said, make the neural circuits more ingrained, make the symptoms worse over time. Mm -hmm. Maybe that the emotional situation that started it is long gone or has resolved. But the focus on the symptom and the worry about the symptom and not getting relief, particularly if you're going to a biomedical model for a neural circuit problem, uh, it will get worse over time and it won't get better. And so there's two ways that we deal with this. Uh, one has to do with dealing with the emotions, which can be important for a lot of people, but it's not always necessary. Because like I say, the emotional situation that occurred may be in the past and may not really be the proximate cause of it now, even though it might have been the genesis of it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's why people will comment on my videos and say, oh my gosh, I, I get it now and my symptoms went down by 50%. I mean, we didn't do any emotional awareness <laughs> on, on my videos, but they learn, oh, this actually isn't dangerous. It's just a false alarm. It's, I call it a prediction error when your brain is predicting movement and you're not actually moving or vice versa. So that explains those cases. Those So many people get better just with the information. Right. So, so And the techniques to lower the fear. Lowering the fear, yeah. The techniques to lower the fear techniques to teach people that they can learn, they can teach their brain that it's safe to turn their head or stand up or bend over. Mm -hmm. And once they start doing that, their brain is learning that it's safe to do those activities. And then those symptoms are turning down. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And that, that is again, so, so profoundly helpful for, for most of the people who watch my channel, but there are some people, as you mentioned, who have symptoms all the time, like people with mal de debarkman symptoms where they're just rocking, bobbing. Often over time, we do discover their symptoms change with emotions, but sometimes they, they're not immediately aware of that. So right. how do you help those people realize that there's some kind of emotional or fear component to their symptoms when they're just all on the time, all on all the time? Right. Well, um, the, the way you would do this one is making sure as, you know, as we pointed out that there's not a structural problem. So it is a neural problem once there's no structural problem. Mm -hmm. Number two, looking at when it started, what was mm -hmm. in their life when it started and that can help them understand. So they have a reason for it. It's like, Oh, this came about because X, Y, and Z happened to me. It's not my mm -hmm. fault. These things happened and my brain was sending out a message. My brain was fearful. Mm -hmm recategorize it once they recategorize it then they can see that the that the sensation is just a sensation and it's not damaging it's not, <clears throat> it's not harmful and it doesn't have to be so scary mm -hmm. and so what we're doing in those situations is helping them lower the danger signal by training themselves that they're safe and not in danger mm -hmm. all the time or anytime <laughs> or most of the time as much of the time as they can and changing their relationship to the sensations. And so people, you know, if, if all of us, everyone has learned to take a sensation that's unpleasant and make it pleasant. Otherwise, no one in the world would drink coffee. No one would drink beer. <laughs> would drink lemons. No one would have dark chocolate. No one would like deep massages or hot saunas. All those are unpleasant physical sensations that many, most people have learned and some, for a lot of them, to make pleasant and enjoy them actually. And so by analogy, what we're helping people do is take these sensations that they hate, that they fear, that they worry about, and that they can't stand and try to help them change their relationship to them, change their reaction to them, and help them try to make the sensations less unpleasant, maybe a little bit fun, maybe interesting, maybe curious, maybe um, mm -hmm. play with them, laugh with them, change their whole mental attitude in relation to those sensations mm -hmm. and that make a huge difference in teaching the brain that it's safe and turning off these, what, as you correctly point out, prediction errors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So ironically by by leaning in by not fighting by by turning toward that's 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 one of the ways in which people can lower the the danger signal by actually leaning in to the to the sensations right and when this and when the symptoms are there they use them as an opportunity to practice getting better mm -hmm. to, to more fear and more worry and and actually the other thing that we do which seems really out there and crazy is to is to is is to ask them to tell their brain to give them more of them rather than less because mm. when you tell somebody when you tell somebody don't do that then they do it it's reverse psychology it happens all mm -hmm. the time someone gets a plate and says it's hot don't touch it the first thing everyone does is touch it mm -hmm. and our brain works the same way and victor frankel showed this many years ago he called it paradoxical intention and um and so what happens is, is that uh, if, you're, if you're saying to your brain, stop it, don't do this, stop that, you're showing that you're afraid of it. Why would you say stop it if you're not fearful of it? Why would you say stop it if, you're not, if it's not driving you up the wall and crazy? So it turns out you can actually make the symptoms better by telling your brain, give me more. Mm. <laughs> That people are afraid, like, oh my God, well, I can't. What if they, what if it answers me and it says, okay, here you can have more, right? But it goes up, and then you know it's your brain. Yeah, then you know it's your brain. Or and it, it goes up and go, okay, I see that. That's more <laughs> evidence. That's my brain. Yeah. Nothing changed structurally. All I did was say, give me more. Mm. I had a patient with this high level five level back pain, and he said, give me more. Bring it on. Give me more. 
I'm not afraid. I can handle it. I've had it before. What's what? What could possibly happen? And it went up. And he said, "Good. Give me more. Make it even higher." And then it went down. And he said, "No. Give me more." And then it went down. And then it went away. Mm. Mm. He was showing absolutely. When you say "give me more," you're showing absolutely no fear. Yeah, mm. really a, a powerful method. And and if you get people to the point of being able to do it, then they've really. In order to do that, you have to really buy in that. It can't hurt you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've, you've had it. You'll have it again. Um, you're still here. Mm-hmm. So let's do whatever we can to make it go away by doing the opposite of trying to make it go away. Yeah, which is the hardest thing. I, I mean, I, I, I tell myself all the time. I tell myself. I tell my viewers all the time. Okay, so once you've got the information, now stop. Stop getting the information. Go do something else. Go go outside. Go do enjoyable things. Right. Leave YouTube behind. Get off social media sites. Right. Right. You have to. You have to decide that you're not going to let it rule your life. Because mm-hmm. the more it rules your life, the stronger it's going to be, and the worse mm-hmm. it's going to be. So it's. Again, it's you're doing the opposite. Instead of trying to make it better, you're, in a sense, stopping worrying about it and creating joy and freedom and peace and calm in your life. Mm-hmm. Those things, it may maybe not immediately, but within a bit of time, you will get better. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that uh, for not everyone needs to go into emotions, but some people do. So what's the indication to someone that there is some emotional work that needs to be done or some emotional awareness that needs to be worked on? Yeah, um, you know, if if there's a situation that's ongoing that's bothering people, a situation mm-hmm. that's stuck in in their lives at work and family and home and whatever, mm-hmm. situations where when you think about it, you get tense, situations when you think about it, you say, I don't want to think about that situations where you you feel a reaction or when you think about them or or they occur your symptoms actually go up so mm-hmm. you know those there's those are the kinds of things that would alert you to say well you know maybe i should deal with some of this emotional stuff that has been going on and some even some of the stuff that went on when i was much younger right it's hard to do that i mean there's not <laughs> it's it's you know, it's it's a good thing actually to do to deal with these emotional situations because everybody has some of them. Mm, yeah, and and so what I I want to reflect some of the things you you just said for emphasis here. So I, I use the word stress a lot in my channel, and a lot of times people will say, "I have no stress. I'm fine. Everything's great." <laughs> but <laughs> which is, I say, "Wow, how'd you do that? I want to I want to have your life now." Um, but what you're describing are, are are those situations that I call sticky. Like at the end of the day, what sticks to you? What makes you feel like I'm not quite shaking that, whatever that is. So you're saying it can be relationships, it can be jobs, it can even be not something obviously awful, not some like really difficult situation, but relationships that you know make us feel not so great or like, oh, I just kind of have I just have to shut my mouth or um situations where I feel like I can't speak my mind or right. it makes me feel like you said, it makes you feel tense. And like, there's not some, something's not flowing. Something's not smooth about it. Yeah. It's something that sticks in your mind. You think about it, think mm-hmm. about it before you go to bed, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when you get into the situation, you feel like you have to be careful. You have to watch what you say. You don't feel at ease in certain places, situations, et cetera, visiting mm-hmm. certain family members, that's sort of all sorts of situations, but mm-hmm. pay attention to how you feel in those situations. You may find that there's some discord or some resentment, frustration or anger, or there's some shame or guilt, or there's some fear. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're saying that even, or especially when we're not aware of those feelings in these stickier situations, that tends to lead to physical symptoms. That can truly lead to physical symptoms. Right, because 
frequently what we're doing is we're just taking those feelings and shoving them down, not even recognizing them, not understanding them, not mm-hmm. pretend they're not there. Mm-hmm. And the things that we push away, the things that we push down, actually have stronger effect on us. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. exactly what can happen. Yeah, and I and I want to run these by you too. It seems to me that some of the people who have those kind of classic personality traits, they 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 fit in the category category of more repressive styles, where they're in other words, they're just not as expressive about emotions. They're not as aware of emotions, but people who are particularly perfectionistic or people pleasing or uh, do-gooders, you know, again, these are kind of the classic traits. So is that the connection there that these, these folks with these traits tend to be better at shoving feelings down and. Right. Those things put more pressure on themselves. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the situation, that's a problem. Then they're saying, Oh, it's my fault or I should be better. I should try Mm -hmm. So that too. Yeah. Well, now there's the double pressure on themselves from the situation and from their reaction to it, mm-hmm. as opposed to being able to stop and say, wait, this is wrong. I don't mean, it's not my fault. I didn't mm-hmm. do anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. <clears throat> and frequently people who have had those kinds of personality traits, and everyone has some of them, of course. Sure. And they're not all bad. Uh, but typically people who have a lot of those are people who have had difficult childhoods or whose parents or caregivers were critical, or whose siblings were critical, or harsh, or judgmental, or teachers, or coaches, people who make them feel not as good, not good enough, mm-hmm. uh, not strong enough, not smart enough, not beautiful enough, not whatever enough. And they've learned because of those situations to try harder, to not rock the boat, to put everyone else first. So those are normal adaptions to times in their life, especially when they were younger, that caused them stress in those years. But then those those traits, those personality traits, just continue on into adulthood. And then at some point, your brain is like, time out, what are you doing? It's like a pressure cooker. We're just adding things to the pot. Yeah, you always do everything for everyone else first. You never do anything for yourself. Um, that's dizzying, that's an imbalance in your life, and the brain may produce dizziness or other sensations. Mm -hmm. Now, people for some reason have a really hard time believing me when I talk about this particular thing, that, wait, you're saying that because I had a difficult childhood and I'm, you know, a perfectionist now that I'm dizzy like how's what's the connection i think you just did a beautiful job of explaining the connection but i i think it will also help people to hear from your personal experience in your clinic have you seen these kinds of approaches helping people be aware of their emotions and express them help people specifically who have chronic dizziness symptoms absolutely uh, absolutely when you help people to express the true feelings in a safe and healthy way. If there's anger, you don't want to send anger out in the world, which is violence. We're not mm-hmm. ever that. But holding anger in all the time hurts you. Mm-hmm. So asking people, we're giving people ways either in writing or verbally or in their imagination to express this anger in safe and healthy ways, to get it up, to get it out, and then to let it go so they're not hanging on to it. Mm-hmm. And then express feelings of hurt and sadness, which also people hold those down and don't re- recognize them and don't express them. But the sadness needs to come out, the sadness of the hurt and the tears and the grief. And when that comes out, then people can move through that into compassion. Because if you're sad for someone, it means you care about them. Mm-hmm. And then they can compress, express compassion for themselves. Mm-hmm. Also compassion for other people in their lives. And when you start to live in compassion, you're letting go of the anger and resentment you had. You're processing the, the, you're letting go of any guilt, you're processing the sadness, and you're moving toward compassion and forgiveness and gratitude. And then you can take deep breaths and be freer. Mm -hmm. Freer in your mind, the symptoms are going to get better or completely go away. It Mm -hmm. happens all the time. Mm -hmm. I find at least in my cohort of people, people will often skip the processing step. They'll say, 
I was wronged. I forgive them. I hear that all the time. Oh, it was a long time ago. I forgive, I forgive him. It was, it wasn't his fault. I hear this, this rational, you know, adult response. But what you're saying is to to reach true self-compassion, to truly let something go, we have to experience it first. Yeah. I think that's been our our situation, our our, our experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, again, if the symptoms if the symptoms go away through doing the fear reduction and the leaning in and the opportunity and the bring it on, the symptoms go away with all that. Yeah, sir. Why you can say, yeah, I guess you, you know, this emotional stuff in the past, you don't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But if the symptoms don't go away with all this other stuff, then, you know, <laughs> maybe there is something there that would be useful to deal with. And even mm -hmm. if, even if it's not directly connected to the symptoms, what we found is people feel better when they do, when they do that kind of emotional work. They literally feel better, mm -hmm. lighter. Is is this sometimes what? You know, I was going to ask about the biomedical model. I think we thoroughly we thoroughly discussed that earlier about what conventional diagnosis and treatment are missing. But mm -hmm. is this where sometimes talk therapy might miss the mark? Because I know many of my folks have gone through. Oh, you know, I processed it. I went. You know, we. I had this marital problem and we went to couples counseling. So I think it's resolved now, but it seems to me that they've done a lot of talking about it, but not a lot of feeling through it. Right. Well, the kinds of, you mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy and talk therapies. Um, they tend to start with the idea for the symptoms. If you're using it for symptoms that they're incurable, we'll just help cope with them. Right. And when it comes to emotional expression, what, people are doing, as you point out, they're saying, well, we'll talk about it so you can understand what happened, understand it cognitively and rationally and deal with it that way. But we are emotional beings. You can't, you can't be in marriage counseling and not have anger <laughs> and guilt and hurt and sadness. It's impossible and fear. Mm -hmm. So if you just kind of push all those down and just work on this upper level of the thinking part of it, you're really missing the boat in terms of the opportunity to really heal and, and really um, help yourself to, to get to the point of truly letting go and truly understanding and forgiving or, or separating or setting boundaries and, and moving to, to gratitude. It's true you need to go to that place for healing, but question is how you get there. Mm -hmm. And if you're bypassing to get there, we're not, we're just, we're leading, we're leaving that reservoir of feelings in there as, as fuel for some of these symptoms. Correct. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so you mentioned journaling, you mentioned working with people, um, you know, in a, in a therapy group or with a coach people watching this video, what are some of the things that they can do right now to start helping themselves with this beyond the learning? Cause they're, if they're on my channel, there's a lot of information on this. We talk a lot about prediction error. We talk a lot about neural circuit stuff, but if they want to start working on emotions, what are some of the easy things they can do right now? Well, um, making a list of things that uh, have been hurtful, mm -hmm. picking out one thing, that kind of is the sticky thing, as you mentioned, that sticks in their mind. That, and it doesn't have to be the biggest thing in their life. They can often start with something that's actually small, a conflict they had with a friend or a sibling uh, or a parent or a child or whatever. But then allowing themselves to ask themselves the question, does this make me annoyed, resentful, frustrated, and or angry? Mm -hmm. and almost all the time there's going to be at least some of that mm -hmm. so to say yeah it does so what what are my feelings of anger and allowing yourself to be in a safe and quiet place where you're completely alone and to just speak your anger out of the world i can't believe you did this this is horrible why would you do this to me i'm sick and tired of it i won't i won't tolerate it i'm angry at you i'm furious at you stop it right now this is disgusting I hate you. This is horrible. And sometimes that can be incredibly freeing. Mm -hmm. You know, what parent has never 
been angry at their kid. That's got to be tough. But if you can never, if you can never allow that anger toward your child, not to them in real life, that would be damaging. But in your imagination, so that you can get it up, you can get it out, and then you can let it go. That's so healing because that can be relieving. So if you allow that anger to come up verbally or in your imagination, sometimes it's helpful to imagine shaking someone or throwing mm-hmm. somebody off a roof or whatever. It's, and you know that's how we are. And so, and then you can purposely let it go. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. Deep, let the anger go, and then look for another emotion. Look for any guilt. Did you actually do something wrong or not? If you're feeling guilty for something you did not, you didn't actually do wrong, then you're just torturing yourself. You have to let go of that. And then you have to go to the hurt and the sadness. And then you allow the sadness to come. Because if there's a, a conflict in a relationship, there's got to be some sadness. So you allow the sadness to come. And then you turn that sadness into compassion. So you've gone through these steps of anger, guilt, sadness, and compassion, forgiveness, setting boundaries. And then you can decide how to act. Because if you act in your relationships out of anger, bad things will happen. Mm-hmm. You're mm-hmm. going to fight. You're going to be testy. You're going to come back. They'll be fighting. But if you act in your relationships out of out of gratitude and compassion and forgiveness and, and knowing that you're okay, then you can act and you can stand up for yourself. You can say what you need to say in civil but assertive ways. You can do what needs to be done. You can say, well, I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to do this, but I can't do that. I just can't do it. So now you're having that balance in your life, and that will lead to balance in your head and in your ears. And, and, and it seems to me what you're saying here is there's a, there's, these emotions have a purpose. There's, we're doing this in service of helping people meet their own needs. It, it's not just about purely expressing rage, although – as you said, there's something very cleansing about allowing our emotions to be, but there's also this, this connection and self-compassion that we can allow in when, when we express ourselves that way. And this compassionate setting of boundaries that many of my folks need to be doing and compassionate making different choices about things that are going on in their lives that people need to do. So that's, that's the ultimate goal, right? Not just the expression. Yeah. And it's, when you do that, you begin to see something incredibly, something completely opposite of what you would have thought at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Beginning, the dizziness and the other symptoms are your enemy. They're betraying you. They're horrible. They're a plague. The worst thing that can ever happen. You just need to get rid of them. And at the, uh, at the end of it, you see them as a gift, mm. messenger, as a guide, guiding you to something that you need to do in your life. And they're not the problem. When you do what you need to do in your life, they'll be gone. Mm-hmm. It's the messenger. And that is a huge reorientation, huge shift. And part of that shift allows people to see that their brain is actually trying to help them by sending these messages. Yes, yes. And I I just want, I can't emphasize this enough. I really do hear this from people. I, I don't put this in their heads at all people will say, I'm so glad this happened to me. I mean, I, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. It was horrible. It was the worst, but I'm, I've grown so much as a result of this. I never would have left the job or made, set this boundary or worked through these difficult situations if I hadn't had this happen to me. And so you've seen that I'm yeah. sure over many, 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 many patients as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are meaning making machines. We look for meaning in our lives. Mm-hmm. And this is a really important way of understanding ourselves and making meaning of it uh, because what makes people happy is having meaning, understanding ourselves, having purpose, connecting to others. Those are the things that make people happy and healthy. And when people are happy and healthy, these mind, body, or neuroplastic symptoms are not really going to be there anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm. They may come back. Yeah. Because we're still human, sure, still occurs in our life, and but when they come back, that's not a problem because you'll know what they are. You'll know how to deal with them, and you don't develop that fear response a second time. I mean, what not that you don't have that initial response, yeah, but the hope is you you learn not to have that fear response a second yeah. time. Your response is up to you. You can, and many people do. Yeah. But nevertheless, yeah, uh, you know, 
life is for learning. And that's what we're doing here. Mm. Well, this was very, very informative. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like folks with chronic dizziness to, to know or understand before we finish today? No, just to know that they can get better. Mm -hmm. Not incurable, that they can get better, to not give up hope, uh, and to live their life in the most in the, in the best way they can. And, uh, and they will, and they will get better. Mm, wonderful. So grateful to you for doing this with me today. Thank you so much, Howard. It's a pleasure. Thanks for all the great work you're doing. I appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you. H highly inspired by all of your work. And uh, again, grateful to learn from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care. Take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye.